Welcome to Behind the Muscle Podcast. Today's guest is an IFBB Pro and 2021 Mr. Canada. Today's guest is Morgan McDonald. Morgan, welcome to the podcast. Hey, man. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. I'm uh, happy to be on. I've uh, done a few of these since uh, when my pro card there last weekend. And uh, yeah, I'm, I just always enjoy chopping it up with like minded individuals. So excited to be here. For sure, dude. So um, I'm, I'm excited to have you fresh off uh, a huge win receiving and earning your IFBB pro card. We're going to get into all of that stuff here at some point. I do like to kind of start all the podcast with asking my guests the same two questions just to kind of keep some of that continuity with our conversation. So the first question, Morgan, that I have for you is who are a few of your favorite bodybuilders of all time? Uh, well, number one would be uh, Kevin Lebroni for sure. Uh, just, I mean, love that guy's whole story. And, and then, you know, physique wise, just his structure um, and just overall, like the way his body was proportioned and the signature he always bought, brought, uh, just, I always love that, especially his bigger looks like in, in 2002, like around that time when, when the, when the size game was really being played and, and he tried to play it. I, I love the big full Kevin Lebroni looks. But I would say, you know, besides him, I always kind of um, drifted towards the taller bodybuilders just because I'm where I'm six foot two. So um, like uh, Cedric McMillan, for example, uh, I always loved his physique. I actually named my first dog after him, <laughs> after he won the De Arnold Classic in 2017. And uh, like Dennis Wolf, another guy that I really looked up to uh, for a long time. So, um, but yeah, I, I would probably say they're, they're probably my top three. Uh, favorite even like the physique wise and just you know guys that I enjoyed following along their careers yeah for sure are there any guys since you uh since you're there in Canada are there any Canadian bodybuilders um whether you know we know of them or not but were there any Canadian bodybuilders uh that you kind of looked up to or maybe oh yeah, absolutely them, right? absolutely yeah like um uh, Frank McGrath uh he's like the only other pro from Newfoundland where I'm from so, I mean, growing up, I mean, he was always the guy. So he was another guy I definitely looked up to, especially seeing him in all the animal pack ads and stuff. It was so cool. Like, you know, myself coming up, chasing the bodybuilding dream. And then you had Frank there who was like, you know, an icon in the industry, right? To just, and, and he even came from a smaller town than I did uh, in Newfoundland, right? So to see a guy like him make it and kind of like, you know, show the rest of us that it's a possibility uh, was, a, was pretty cool. So he's definitely a guy that I looked up to. Uh, and Canadian, I mean, you know, fortunately now like we, we do have a lot of good Canadian pros. So even the most recent years, like, yeah, the like guys, you know, would always follow uh, like Regan, Antoine, you know, Quinn, since he's come up. Um, and, and there's lots of other guys too. I mean, that, that I could mention for sure. Ian Bellier, obviously. And just seeing these Canadian guys do so well, um, I mean, has been really motivating for me, especially the last year or two, like, you know, when I really felt that I was getting close to be to being a, like a contender for a pro card or to actually have a pro worthy physique, it was starting to become more realistic. So yeah, I definitely drew a lot of motivation from those guys for sure. Yeah. Awesome, man. Yeah. Frank McGrath, he's, uh, he's one of those guys that he's kind of like, I, I did a, a story, a IG story last week of like my top three dream guests for the podcast. And Frank's definitely one of them just because like, you know, growing up, uh, you know, with the magazines and those animal ads, like it's just, it's legendary. It's iconic. And, um, it, I don't think it'll ever be, uh, it'll ever, never be repeated because magazines are basically dead. Right. And it was just something, something unique and special. So super cool. Now the second question, Morgan, that I have for you, at what age did you start lifting weights? And then why did you start lifting weights at that age? Um, I started lifting, um, well, basically, you know, in my earlier years, like coming up through high school and stuff, I played like pretty high level of basketball. And uh, that came an end, like that came to an end for me, like around my first few years of university. So yeah, and like I, I basically at first when I stopped playing basketball, I just kind of parodied a lot and stuff, just being in university. Uh, and at the time, obviously knew nothing about nutrition or how any of that worked, but I, I was basically starting to get fat. So I knew I had to do something, and uh, so I took advantage of like the university gym and, and started going in there. And I responded like really well, especially my lower body. Like, I mean, as soon as I started squatting and stuff, like I just, I couldn't fit into jeans, like within like weeks and, and things like that. 
And, and because it was kind of coming so easy to me and I had very good coordination from basketball. So I picked up like, you know, the lifting techniques and just the basic lifting techniques very easily. So I think because of that, I was able to get results pretty quick. Uh, so I started lifting around then, but you know, bodybuilding didn't become serious uh, for me until I decided I want to do my first show about a couple of years later when I was 20. And that's like when I hired my first coach and, and started learning more about nutrition and, and how all that worked and how it affected the body. And, and once I kind of discovered how you can really control how you look with, with nutrition combined with training, obviously, uh, and, and got my first show under my belt, that's when I was just like completely hooked on it. Like I couldn't get enough of it, just seeing results, like, you know, trying different things to, you know, just to try to improve. And then obviously seeing the results year after year. I mean, it's, it's the best thing when you're trying to chase a good physique, right? So for sure. Very cool. All right. So that's uh, uh, kind of the question that I like to use to transition into the backstory, kind of the, the, uh, the childhood. So if you don't mind touching on, you already brought up basketball, um, but just touch on kind of growing up. What did your childhood look like? I'm assuming sports was a big part of it. Uh, you know, if you want to touch on family, siblings, anything that maybe stands out from that childhood, maybe work your way up to high school and then we'll, we'll touch on uh, college slash what you guys call it in Canada university. Um, but just kind of bring us up to high school and then we'll, we'll transition from there. Yeah. I mean, definitely, uh, like heavily involved in sports, like from an early age. So, you know, my first thing was like the karate, which I did from like the five years old to the age 18, uh, which was really good for me. Um, you know, because in my, in my earlier years, like when I was young, like I didn't, I didn't have very much and stuff like that. Um, but the karate was one thing my, my mom could afford to have me in. And that really kept kind of my head on straight, you know, taught me a lot of life lessons that I definitely carried with me. And especially just in a sense of like having discipline and being able to control your, uh, your emotions and, and, and temper and things like that. Um, but basketball, it kind of really took over and I was lucky enough to, you know, be involved in like really high level programs like in Canada and things like that. So from an early age, I got really used to working with just like coaches that were, you know, like pretty tough, like, uh, you know, they expected a lot. And, and I had like, you know, most of my summers, I was doing two a day basketball practices and like running and all this stuff. So, you know, I, I was, you know, work ethic was instilled in me like at a really young age and, and I loved it. Like I love nothing more than just being active and, and trying to get better and, and, and all that stuff. You know, I enjoyed, you know, some of the coaches were, like I said, were pretty tough and, you know, there would be a lot of like punishment type runs and things like that. You know, if you weren't performing, like you were, you would be disciplined for it. And I actually enjoyed all, all that. So, you know, looking back and, and kind of seeing how I've become a bodybuilder, it kind of all makes sense. Like, you know, from a mentality standpoint, uh, that this is something that I would, you know, get into and do well with. Um, but yeah, basketball, you know, it took me, like I said, right through high school, uh, played a little bit with it in university, but it, it basically just didn't really work out between like my grades and, and a few other things, uh, which, you know, basically ended up me just kind of giving it up and trying to focus more on my studies and things like that. Um, and then, yeah, and then that's kind of like when the, when the weightlifting and stuff started. So, yeah. Um, okay. So uh, in terms of basketball, obviously I'm here in the, in the States. I'm not too familiar with, with, with how things uh, uh, unfold in Canada in terms of sports, but um, now like here in the States, like we have for, for the younger kids um, it's like AAU basketball, you know, it's like kind of year round. It's kind of like the, the competitive stuff. Is that kind of similar to how it is in Canada? Do you have like all these different traveling teams and it's kind of like, different levels of competition or what does kind of that youth basketball look like in Canada specifically? Yeah. So, you know, from, from like a national level standpoint, so like I obviously played like high school basketball and like I was on the best high school team, like we won everything and stuff like that. But um, so there's like a national basketball tournament, like every year there's like basketball nationals. So I played on team Newfoundland, um, like on the under 15 team and then on the under 17 team for two years, and then for under 18s, we went to Canada Games, which is basically like a Olympics for youth sports in Canada. So like you go and you stay in whatever province for like a week and like there's all these other events going on. It's, it's basically like, like the Olympics, right? Um, so that was like basically like the highest level I, I, I would say I played at. And at the time, I actually had to pick between to go to Canada Games for karate or to go for basketball. But yeah, so um, and I basically played basketball because at the time, like all my buddies were on the team and stuff. And I obviously want to stick with your friends. But I always say now in hindsight, kind of seeing like where how MMA took off and the UFC and stuff, like I always kind of wondered if I had to stay that route and kind of like 
go into other things like where that could have went. But basketball kind of led to bodybuilding, so it all did end up working out for me. Uh, but yeah, and then essentially it's like, you know, it's the same thing after high school, like, you know, you get scouted for universities, especially at those like national level tournaments. That's generally where they acquire players from. So, um, yeah, you get different universities come look at you and stuff, but the, the only university basketball I dabbled in was like the beginning of like the season of like my local university, Memorial University in Newfoundland. Um, but then, like I said, like, you know, for a couple of different reasons, things didn't really work out there. And then, uh. But, but yeah, that's that's like you know essentially how it works in Canada. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one, this is this is always kind of a fun part of, of of my podcast is you know you get these high level uh, coaches and IFBB pros and top amateurs on the podcast, and you know we're going to focus mostly on bodybuilding. But it's always fun to kind of get into the child and the backstory because then I get to ask a, a question like this. So, um, what's kind of growing up? Were you uh, did you follow like the NBA pretty closely? And, and if so, you know, were you a, were you a Raptors fan or, or what did that look like when you were younger, a Bulls fan? I'm sure it was Jordan and the Bulls in the nineties, but what, what are, what are like maybe your favorite team as a, as a kid? And is it the same to this day? Do you kind of still follow basketball or not really? Uh, I'm like this with a lot of sports. I don't often get caught up in teams. I, I more actually get caught up in players. Um, you know, I've always been obsessed with like just champions and, and you just know when you, when there's someone great, like Kobe Bryant's an easy example to use, right? Like, I mean, that guy was an elite basketball player from the time he was in the league to the time he left the league. So like, I would always notice these like people, like these like special players pretty quickly. And I would just be infatuated with like, what makes them like that? Like, why are they so different from the other really high level basketball players that are around? Like they're, you know, the people who are uncommon amongst uncommon people is like really what interests me you know what i mean like i want to know what drives them so i would yeah so like you know between like kobe lebron and obviously like that michael jordan documentary that came out recently the last dance like watching that was just like you know unreal to see how just how focused that guy was and, and, and his determination to not only make himself better but, but the things he would do and the extent he would go to make his teammates better and like and then not even understanding that he was trying to make them better like that's how much of like an intellectual like he was like in his field, right? It's just incredible. So yeah, I mean, it's hard for me to think back now because I'm so far away from basketball, but Kobe Bryant's one that stands out a lot. And uh, I mean, obviously he passed away recently and that, that that's something that hit me hard. You know, I cried the day Kobe Bryant died because he had such an impact on me through my competitive years of basketball that carried over just into my life. Like, you know, just that mindset that he carried the mama mentality um was just incredible so i think the impact he left uh you know i was lucky enough to be coming up through his prime because i got to like see him in his prime and i think it left an impact on me right so yeah very cool man very cool definitely uh gotta respect mamba mentality uh for sure so we'll uh so you kind of touched on college university a little bit um let's kind of like just uh talk about, I mean, when you were at that age, you know, kind of the um, finishing up high school, going into university, where was your mindset kind of before you got into the bodybuilding and the strength training and all that, where was your mindset, uh, Morgan, in regards to kind of like what you were going to do career wise or for a job once you kind of got a little bit older? Yeah. So like right before I got into bodybuilding, I was uh, actually going to school to be a remotely operated uh, vehicle pilot, like sort of basically go work offshore and fly underwater robots for like oil companies and stuff like that. And I was pretty much done it. Like this was when I was like really getting into the weightlifting and, and things like that, going to the gym all the time. And uh, I just knew that I wasn't going to be able to live a lifestyle and be happy about like going offshore three weeks on three weeks off living that type of life. Like, because, you know, the longer I was in school for it, the more you learn and the more people you talk to that, like actually like have, have experience with it. And it just wasn't lining up with how I wanted to live my life. So like in my last semester, I actually quit, uh, which was tough, tough one on my parents. <laughs> and I, uh, before I quit, I went to the, like a local gym I was going to. I kind of asked if they were looking for personal trainers and they knew I'd been around for a while. So they offered me a job and were willing to kind of get me started and stuff like that. But luckily, I had a couple of friends that worked there at the time. So I, yeah, I mean, that's that's what I was going to do. I, uh, but then I just, I just knew that 
you know, for some reason, the whole bodybuilding and fitness lifestyle was really just like kind of calling out to me. I was super indulged in it. Like every experiment that I had, I was on YouTube or on T Nation, like reading articles, just trying to learn as much as I could about training and eating and things like that. Right. So yeah, I went home, broke the news to my parents. I was quitting school for the second time at that point. <laughs> so uh, I was going to become a personal trainer at the gym and chase a bodybuilding dream. So it was, uh, it was a pretty, it took a lot of convincing. Uh, but, you know, when my parents saw me basically start making all these lifestyle changes, because that was the other thing, like when I was going to university, you're kind of going to fall into the crowd. So like I was doing like a lot more partying than I should have been. I was getting caught up in some stuff that like weren't so good. That definitely could have led to like a, a, a worse path than, than it did, luckily. Um, but yeah, I, you know, it was the best thing I ever did because I ended up being so just in love with the fitness lifestyle and training that I became a pretty good personal trainer. I ended up doing like really well with it. Uh, you know, for like five or six years, I was training people one-on-one -on -one, and eventually I just transitioned to online coaching, which is what I do now full time. So, um, so yeah. Um, so one quick question that I have for you before we, uh, fully dive into all things bodybuilding kind of like where you're from, you, you, you mentioned, uh, Newfoundland, uh, like, is, is there, a, is it kind of like blue collar and do a lot of people just kind of like stay in the area and don't really get out of that area or, or am I wrong in, in, in asking that? No, you're very correct. Um, I mean, in Newfoundland is like obviously a big island off the East coast of Canada, uh, and we have a different, we definitely have a different type of culture here than like the rest of Canada. You know, you could even kind of say like we're our own country, like the way we kind of run things and the way we are around here. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it is very much like that. A lot of people that grow up in Newfoundland kind of want to stay here. Obviously, they feel very secure here and, and we're our own kind of people. So we like being around each other, right? Um, so, and yeah, very blue collar, very, you know, you know, a lot, like I said, a lot of guys live like the shift work lifestyle. You know, a lot of guys are going back and forth to Alberta. They're going back and forth offshore. And, and, and generally in Newfoundland, like, it, we, you know, I, the only way I know how to say this, like, we kind of have like, an unhealthy culture here. Like, we're very, like, alcohol uh, oriented, you know, like, we have George Street, which is downtown, which is the most bars per square kilometer in the world, uh, and very food oriented. Now, we have great food, and that's awesome. <laughs> but, you know, that's what people do here. Like, there's you know, fitness is, we're very behind on fitness here. Now, like it is coming up, like there's more gyms opening and stuff like that. More people are getting involved, but we're definitely behind the rest of Canada on that train, especially from a nutritional standpoint. Like we have the highest obesity rate in Canada. We have the highest diabetes rate in Canada here, uh, all things like this, right? So, you know, growing up here, it's very easy to kind of fall into an unhealthy lifestyle uh, uh, for sure. So, um, but yeah, generally, like I said, most people kind of stay here and, and, and not a lot of us get out, but you know, that's something that I know for me, bodybuilding was, you know, one of my original plans was to use bodybuilding as an avenue to, you know, eventually leave here just because there's more opportunities, especially like I said, in fitness and bodybuilding elsewhere than there is here. So, you know, that, that, that's something I'm, I'm actually working towards myself now just to help expand my career, not only from a competitive standpoint, but just from like a networking standpoint and building my business up even more. Yeah. For sure, man. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so let's, uh, so you, you mentioned earlier, 20 years old is kind of when you, uh, first, uh, started heading in that direction of competing, got, got a coach and all that type of stuff. Um, so why don't you just unpack, uh, Morgan, if you don't mind for, for myself and the listeners, kind of your, your, uh, contest history, um, talk about maybe that first show, maybe, um, some of the positives, the negatives, and just, uh, just share a little bit up to the point of, you know, when you just, just literally here uh, within the last couple of weeks earned your IFBB pro card. So start from the first show and just kind of walk us through that competition history, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So first show was 2013. Um, didn't really have much of an off season before. Just, just sort of got a coach, jumped into a 16 week prep. Um, I remember going through that prep and, you know, obviously your first prep is the hardest thing you do, right? So going through that prep being like, I'm going to finish this, but there's no way I'm ever doing it again. And then eventually I compete. It was like our local Newfoundland provincial show. You know, if you win, you get top three, you qualify for nationals kind of thing, right? So I go as a junior. I got like second in the juniors and third in the open heavyweight, I think like that, something like that. But I, but I loved it. Like I love the whole process. I love getting tan, like going out on stage posing. Like I thought it was all awesome. And then I remember seeing uh, this competitor, John Whelan. He's a, he's a legend in Canadian bodybuilding. He's been competing for 20 years. I actually did his last show with him back in July and he was there for my first show. So it was pretty cool. 
Uh, but he won that show and, you know, he's a shorter guy, but just absolutely shredded tons of muscle and just seeing him with the overall, I just knew, I was like, okay, I, I need to know what that feels like one day. Like that was my ultimate goal was to win overall, especially like my Newfoundland show. Um, yeah, I just thought it'd be so cool. So that's kind of what motivated me. And, uh, I mean, we can definitely kind of, I, I did compete in like 2014, 2015, you know, got a couple of second places in the heavyweight division. So, you know, those were definitely years that were just like a lot of learning. Um, you know, work with a couple of different coaches in between. So I picked up a lot of things from them, but things didn't really get, well, I would say 2017, I decided to go get my first nationals, um, which, I, which I definitely wasn't ready for, but I'm so glad I did it because it gave me um, a lot of realization of the, where I was and how much work I actually needed to do to get to where I wanted to be. So my first nationals, I think I got 12th place in the super heavyweight class out of like 18 guys or something like that. Uh, I, was, I was shredded, but just small, right? So 2017, did a pretty good off season in 2018. Uh, 2018, things got a bit more competitive. I did the Atlanta Classic and got second, which is a pretty big show. Uh, and from there, I went and did my second nationals um, and I got eighth place out of 18 guys. Um, again, really shredded, but I kind of, it was another good learning experience because I actually coached myself for that show and I, was shredded, but I kind of overdid it on the diuretics and some of the uh, like estrogen inhibitors as I got closer to the show, I just ended up looking flat. So, but again, something else I'm glad I did because it, you know, I learned a lot from that. And then again, was way undersized. So that's when I started working with Dorian Hamilton uh, at the beginning of 2019. And that was uh, you know a big uh, benefit to me. Dorian taught me a lot about digestion. Uh, he, he completely reformatted how I was training. I was, you know, I was training way too much volume you know, barely taking any rest days, just, you know, not letting myself grow essentially. So once Dorian took control of everything, we ended up getting my weight up to like 330 pounds in the off season. We maintained that for about a year, which really helped the muscles stick. It, you know, it helped me achieve a new homeostasis in my body and it really put the size on that I needed. Um, so then basically from there, started getting ready for the Toronto Pro in 2020, which got canceled because of COVID. Then we, kind of move through me and Dorian kind of go our separate ways just because like, you know, there's not much going on with shows and stuff like that. Uh, and then when things kind of started to open back up, that's when I got in touch with Ron Partlow, who's my current coach. Um, and we started getting ready back in March of this year for um, the Atlanta Classic in July and the local Newfoundland show, which was a week after in July. Um, so my first prep with Ron, we get ready for Atlantix. We come in, not at hundred percent, but just based off the competition, we knew we were showing up. Like we were really just trying to grab a qualification for national. So, you know, we jumped in the show, a little softer than I should have been, decided not to cut water at all. Didn't take any diuretics or anything like that. We ended up winning an overall at that show. That kind of, that show was kind of like two shows in one. There was like this gladiator portion, which is like this more of like this big show promotion. And then they have like the actual Atlanta classic part. So I won the overall at the gladiator part. And then in the Atlanta classic, it's kind of, it's open up to all of Canada, whereas the gladiator portion is only Atlanta Canada. So uh, this guy from Quebec jumps in, uh, Derek Lamontag. So he actually won the heavyweight class at nationals a couple weeks ago. Um, so he actually beat me in that show which was very good for me because it kind of let us know that we were not on, we were way softer than we should have been. So basically from that show, we had a week in between uh, till the Newfoundland show, which I had still had in one, which was like my original goal in bodybuilding, right? So, so I basically go no carbs for like a week and do it. And we cut water, we take some diuretics for that show. We bring a way drier look, way better look for about, you know, six, seven pounds uh, less than we were at Atlantic. So, we kind of knew we were on to something. Uh, we got the overall there, which I was pretty happy about. And then we had eight weeks between the uh, Newfoundland show and the Canadian Nationals. So I was basically in contest shape. So we decided that we were just gonna, you know, play around with high days and low days for essentially eight weeks to, to hold that condition. And by, you know, one thing I know for sure is by holding that condition for, you know, for that amount of time, it really allowed my skin to get like super paper thin. And, and I really had to starve myself to get down that weight. But the longer we stayed at that weight, the more my metabolism just picked up. And like, like for the last two weeks leading into nationals, I was eating like Burger King every second day. I was having like big sushi refeeds. I don't think my carbs got below 500 grams of carbs two weeks going into the show. And cardio was like just going out and walking my dogs. 
So my body was in a really good place going into nationals. And I just think the combination of being able to, of staying so lean for so long, but also being able to eat so much really allowed my muscles to stay really full. So by the time nationals came around, I, my conditioning was perfect. I was full as a house. The muscle was pushing up against the skin. And uh, I think we just peaked perfectly for that show. And, you know, between my size and, and my conditioning being, you know, pretty far ahead of everyone else's, I think that's why yeah, I ended up getting the win there, you know. Beautiful, man. Now, before I take a couple steps back and, and touch on some, some coaching stuff, why don't you obviously uh, earning your IFBB pro card is, 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 is an amazing accomplishment and, and achievement. Why don't you just touch on kind of some of the feelings, the emotions, talk about that entire day, the experience, um, maybe some of the, the, the highs of the highs and uh, just, just unpack that day and, and, when you actually uh, talk about when you actually knew like, okay, like this, I'm, I'm going to get my pro card today. Like I'm, I'm getting that IFBB pro card today. So maybe just talk about the experience, talk about the day, talk about that moment when you knew uh, the pro card was yours. I knew Saturday morning <laughs> as soon as I woke up. Uh, just, I, I just knew when I looked at myself that we had peak perfectly. I, I was dry to the bone. I was super full. The carb up went perfect. My digestion was perfect. Like we had zero issues. So I literally knew like I just had to go backstage and wait for them to put us on stage and I was going to take it. Um, you know, but it's very interesting. And that's a question I've got a lot is how I felt. And the more I get asked, it, like, the more I reflect on it. And, um, you know, you, you would think like you would be like ecstatic in the moment, you know, but for myself, you know, visualization is a tool that I use like, like all the time, every day, um, you know, even just to get through like a normal day, you know? So, you know, winning my pro card is something that, you know, I've been chasing after for eight or nine years, but like has seriously been a goal of mine for the last like two or three. And I visualize myself winning my pro card, you know, 10,000 times. So, it's almost like you've already been there. And, 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 you know, even when it comes to like posing going on stage, like I, I visualize myself, you know, posing on that national stage for months and months before it actually happens. So, and by doing that, it kind of allows you to be very comfortable when you're in the moment. Cause it's like in your, in your mind, you've already been there. It's just the physical act of going and doing it at that point. Right. So, yeah, I mean, when I won my pro card, definitely like the anticipation there of them, calling your number is, is crazy because you never know with bodybuilding. So you're kind of like, okay, <laughs> like, but when they call my name, um, it, in a way it had felt like a big weight had been lifted off my shoulders in that moment, because, you know, like I said, I, I, I've known, you know, the last couple of years I've had a pro quality physique. It's just been a matter of peaking at the right time at the right show to, to, to accomplish the goal. So, you know, for us to nail it on that day and, you know, for everything to fall in place, like it did, it was, a, like I said, a big weight lift off my shoulders. And, and just to know I finally had my foot in the door to be in the pro league. I don't have to worry about qualifying anymore or doing these qualifier shows, these smaller shows where, like, I really just, like, you know, you just don't belong in it anymore. Uh, and now I can just focus on, you know, making a good pro debut and, and just, you know, bang out pro shows until hopefully one day we get to the Olympia. Like, that's the goal. So I think, yeah, just from, like, a, being a competitor, like, that weight being lifted was great. But, um, you know, the feeling of, you know, emotion and excitement, it, it kind of more so came after. Like, it's, it's very weird. And you kind of just, whenever I had a moment to actually reflect, because so much comes at you after something like that happens, obviously, right? Uh, especially with social media and everything. Uh, but I, I definitely had a couple moments, you know, even sitting in the airport, uh, waiting to go home. I finally had some time with myself and like, I, I broke down and started crying in the airport <laughs> just cause you, cause when you get to reflect on everything that led to that and, and how much you put into it and like, you know, you can look back on some days that you'd never, you didn't think you were going to get through. Like, you know, like there's some, some days you were wishing for death <laughs> over cardio, <laughs> right? And, and you, you understand that once you accomplish something like that, that, it actually is all worth it because that, that's, that's the, you know, that's the hardest part about prep is putting yourself through something that's so hard. And I mean, you know, you could get to the day of the show and one thing could go wrong. It could all just go down the drain. It could be for nothing. Right. So, you know, to put myself what I went through, especially being in prep for 27 weeks straight and then getting the result that we wanted. Um, yeah. I mean, it was, it was, it, when I did feel the emotion, it was overwhelming. I want you to touch on a little bit more, if you don't mind, Morgan, um, 
uh, in, in regards to the visualization? Because you kind of said you would visualize yourself uh, earning your pro card and being on that stage, you know, thousands of times. But then you also said that you use visualization just to kind of make it through each day. Um, what is that? What does that specifically look like? Is it like a set time every morning that you go into a dark room and you close your eyes and you visualize? Is it something that you just kind of do throughout your day as you go? What does that practice of visualization look like? And I, I, I'm interested and intrigued to learn more about this because I truly believe uh, visualization, uh, that mental practice is something that is very powerful. And it's an area, whether you're a bodybuilder uh, or some other athlete or just, you know, somebody just, you know, that's a, a business owner or whatever, it's, it's a practice that we can all tap into more to really strive and, and, and achieve the best version of, of, our, of ourselves. So what does that practice on the day-to-day -day look like for you? It can be any time of day, but like, like to start my day, like, you know, every morning, like I have to go to morning cardio, no matter what, no matter if I'm prepped, off season, taking a break, doesn't matter. When I wake up, I have to move. So it's either I put my clothes on and take my dogs for like a 40 or 50 minute walk. If it's bad weather, luckily the gym is like five minutes down the street. I put my stuff in and I go hit the treadmill. Uh, so, you know, because I'm like, I'm so fresh in the morning, um, I'm still kind of in that parasympathetic mode. So my mind still feels very calm. Like, you know, I'm not like pretty much sleepy. Right. But I know like, you know, the start of my day, like my, my client check and start rolling in, you know, I got to get my six meals in. I got to check in with my coach. Probably I got to figure out, okay, what time am I going to train? That's like still optimal for me today when I have all these other things piling up. And then it's like just other tasks, you know, like I, I got two big dogs. I got to take care of by myself. Like, so all these little things add up and, and most of my days are pretty blocked. So I find that morning cardio, it just gives me time to just rearrange like everything in my head. And then once I kind of know the order, I'm going to tick all the boxes that day. I just visualize myself actually doing it. So it's like, okay, once I'm done this cardio, I'm going to go shower and then I got to feed my dogs and then I got to get my meal and then I got to start working on my client updates. And then I got to do this. Then I got to have a meal too. Then we got to get ready for the gym and I'll just visualize my entire day and me doing each thing. Uh, even getting to the act, like if I, if I'm like, okay, we're going to the gym after meal too. Okay. What am I going to do at the gym? What exercises am I going to do? Like, you know, so, and if you do about 50 or 60 minutes of cardio, by the time you get to the end of it, you're carry on. Right. But, but yeah, I'll have, I'll have many times throughout the day where, well, sometimes I'll just take five or 10 minutes um, with, with no distractions and just put my head back, close my eyes you know, in prep, oftentimes it was just visualizing myself on stage or, or going to the workout I had to do that day, anything like that. But um, I mean, for me, it's one of the most powerful tools that helps keep my anxiety at bay. Uh, it really helps me not get overwhelmed and it just keeps me on task and helps me stay, stay productive and, and, and do whatever I'm trying to do at like the most optimal level. Because like I said, I truly believe if you can put yourself somewhere mentally long before you actually get there physically, by the time you get there physically, there's nothing that's going to surprise you. There's nothing that's going to come at you and that you're not going to be ready for because you've already been there. Right. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's something I definitely encourage. And, and I, I actually plan on talking about it more myself and my own social media outlets because of how beneficial it is for me. And I think it could be, you know, awesome for other competitors and just, you know, people in general who are, you know, just trying to get through their day. Right. Absolutely, man. So I want to kind of take a step back here and, and touch on, um, some of your coaching experiences, I, I don't, we won't really get into like the, the early ones, but you know, the two people that you brought up that seem like have had a huge profound impact on your bodybuilding career, Dorian Hamilton, and then, and, and then Ron Partlow. First of all, you mentioned you started working with Dorian in 2019 and he kind of helped you with the digestion side of things and got you up to 330 pounds for a year. And just really sounds like kind of took you to that next level in terms of what it takes to be an elite bodybuilder. Just talk, talk about a little bit more in depth um, that experience with Dorian and maybe some of those things that he really helped you, um, you know, understand, grasp, and uh, kind of refine within your, your, your bodybuilding career. I think I was caught up in variety in not only my nutrition, but also my training. Like I basically had myself convinced that with training, like every workout had to be different to keep my body responding. And like I had to hit back twice a week to grow my back and, and all these things. And really what I was lacking was just intensity in my workouts and more focused on like progressive overload, trying to get stronger. But 
you know, with that, with those types of goals and training comes like the nutritional need for that to be productive. You know, the ultimate goal for hypertrophy is to be focused on a progressive overload in your training, but also training smart uh, and eating enough to support that. Obviously you need to be in a calorie surplus to get stronger. You need to be in a calorie surplus to get bigger, but all that needs to be calculated. And in order for everything to be optimal, you want your body digesting foods efficiently, you know? So we found what foods work for me and we ate a lot of them. Uh, you know, like my, my only carb source came down to rice, right? I could eat a lot. I could get a ton of carbs from rice, digest it fine. So that's what we went with, with the exception of like a couple bowls of cereal and stuff like that as well, right? Um, but when we found that combination of, okay, you know, we went back to just basic training, like one body part, one time per week. So I was only training five times per week. Um, exercise selection, instead of having all this variety in exercises, I just picked like five, six, seven exercises for each body part that I liked. Most training sessions look the same. Every now and then I would throw in an exercise, take one out, just kind of keep things interesting. But by doing the same exercises week to week, it allowed me to focus more on progressive overload, track my weights, make sure I was getting stronger. Whereas obviously if you're doing different exercises every week, you have no idea if you're improving or not, right? So, you know, you combine that with the uh, diet methodology that Dorian had. Um, yeah, that was like the winning thing. That, and, and I was able to stay pretty lean, even at like up to the 325, 330 range. I still had abs. I still had some lines in my legs and my glutes. Um, you know, so we definitely did things right. And, you know, I, I even got blood work done at 330 pounds. My doctor couldn't believe it. And Dorian couldn't believe how healthy I was. So, you know, I think the key thing in the off season is just finding a way to run everything optimally uh, to get the most out of it. And that's what we did. And, and it, yeah, it worked tremendously. Okay, so before you uh, talk about Ron, I want you, if you don't mind, to talk about the digestion thing. That's something um, that comes up every once in a while. If, if I come across one of my guests on their social media and they, they're, they're talking about it, I try to bring it up on the podcast. Um, just like I said uh, yesterday on one of my uh, podcast conversations, I, I just think it's so important for bodybuilders to understand the importance of digestion. And they're starting to be more light shed on that but yet when you consume enough bodybuilding content whether it's a uh, bodybuilders on instagram or youtube or 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 podcasts um you 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 start to hear of some of these digestive issues that a lot of these bodybuilders have especially if they've been in the game for a long time um i i, I know even like uh james flex lewis like he's I've, I've heard a few things here and there about some of his digest digestive issues so it's very important. There is, like I said, some more light starting to be shed on it, but not enough from my personal opinion and perspective. So um, you have a, a great um, kind of within your saved stories, you have some great information, very valuable information in regards to digestion. If you maybe just kind of want to touch on that um, and explain that and break that down, that, that would be greatly appreciated, Morgan. Yeah, well, I think there's just a lot of foods, like body, like traditional bodybuilding foods that actually aren't that good that a, people, like a lot of people are still consuming. Um, like oatmeal, for example, I think is, it's, it's, it's funny. Uh, me and Dorian like have this like ongoing conflict with oats between us both. Like uh, we both loved oats, but when he first started coaching, like oats were a big no-no. So it was like on cream of rice. Um, and since, you know, I ended up competing against Dorian at nationals. And when we were going through our prep together, I saw he was eating oats again. So I messaged him. I'm like, what, I'm like, what is this? I'm like, you coached me for a year and a half. Tell me I can't have oats. And now all of a sudden you're eating oats again. And he's like, oh no, man, like if you, if you buy these organic oats, like they digest fine. So I went out and tried them and sure enough, they digested fine. So Dorian Silva, the guy with digestion, he figures out all the, all the things that are good or not and shares it with the rest of us. So, uh, so yeah, so I so I actually got back on the oats myself recently, as long as they're these organic, uh, like President's Choice brand, they, they seem to be pretty good. But I find like regular store bought quick oats give a lot of people, uh, you know, digestive issues. And I, and I have a lot of experience with this now, not only myself, but because I've coached like hundreds of people at this point, so I've I've helped many many people overcome digestive issues. So I've been able to outline, you know, pretty accurately which foods cause pe people most issues, right? So oats are very common. Uh, egg whites are another one that that negatively affects people i find again right like choosing regular egg whites as opposed to free run egg whites like you'll notice a big difference that's something i noticed myself if i use like regular costco egg whites i would get really gassy not be able to digest them if i bought free run egg whites it was they were a lot better right so i think just 
it can be hard, obviously, you know, with, as bodybuilders, we have big food budgets. So we tend to sometimes buy the cheaper version of things, right? Being like, oh, it's the same. Like this, this normal egg is, this farmed egg is the same as this free range egg, but it's not, right? And over the long term, making these better choices, um, even though they might be more expensive, can, can actually definitely have a positive impact. But then other foods like sweet potatoes is another one that gives a lot of people issue, issues. Um, and, gr and green vegetables in general are terrible not i don't have very many clients at all i would say maybe five percent of my clients have green vegetables in their diets because uh, that's the only clients i have that can actually digest them um but yeah like things like green beans broccoli uh, raw spinach um, asparagus oftentimes uh, give people a lot of digestive issues a lot of digestive backup and that's why you see people in prep always complain oh, i haven't i haven't went to the washroom in three or four days and it's because i mean obviously they're hungry but they're supplementing their diet with extra vegetables and especially with these green vegetables um they back up digestion they cause big issues right and and that's terrible because if you have backed up digestion you have inflammation in your digestive system and your gut this inflammation is going to prevent you from actually absorbing nutrients from your other foods like your proteins and your starchy carbs that you need for energy and recovery so you know, you're eating these foods that I think are benefiting you, but really they're having such a negative impact. They're not even allowing you to digest your other foods properly. So, I mean, you, you run into a big issue here now, like not only do you have digestive issues, but you're not even absorbing nutrients. So how are you going to progress? Like, how are you supposed to lose body fat or gain muscle, like whatever your goals are, right? So I think people need to understand that if you want to be a good physique athlete, or if you're trying to, you know, get the most out of your physique, there need to be sacrifices made in the sense that like you might not be able to eat certain foods that you like eating even though they're good whole foods right like myself in my in my off season for example my diet was i think there was no egg whites like i would do a couple of free range eggs i was eating chicken breast four times a day salmon once and then one red meat meal and one protein shake uh, you know, as far as the fattier meats went, like I knew like salmon, I could do once a day. That was fine. Steak. I could do once a day. That was fine. If I had any more, I would start getting digestive issues, but if we stuck to chicken or white fish or ground Turkey for those other lean protein source meals, I was good to go. Um, and like I said, rice was what I stuck with just because it worked. Like, did I want sweet potatoes sometimes? Did I want white potatoes sometimes? Yes. I would have it and I would get gas and it would make me not want to eat my next meal, which would then impact my training the next day. You get these chain effects in bodybuilding, right? Especially if you're, if you take it serious and you're really on track with everything, right? Like you have one bad meal and it messes up your digestion and you could, you could be off your game for two or three days. Those are two or three days you're not going to get back. And I hate to tell you, but in bodybuilding, every single day counts in the off season and the prep, right? So the more optimal you can keep things by just learning what foods work for you, what foods you know you're going to digest well, keep those in. That's what's going to keep training performance high, right? That's what's going to keep your recovery high. And that's what's going to get you the results. Like, so, I mean, you might just have to give up some food you like. Like, I know, like peanut butter was a big one, but you see a lot of coaches and a lot of bodybuilders just removing peanut butter altogether and just added fats in general. Like, I know so many guys now, their only fat sources are what they get from their meat, right? So what they get from their eggs, their salmon, their, their beef, and they're having really good results with that because a lot of times these added fats like avocados and, and natural peanut butter like they, they slow down the digestion of your food too much right even though they taste good and it's a nice add-on to your meal um i just think that uh things like that hold people back even though they're kind of whole foods right so it, but i mean at the end of the day everyone is still different some people are going to be able to get away with things that other people aren't you know and you're going to get some people that just have iron stomachs and can literally just eat everything and be fine right but I mean, if you're a physique athlete, like, you know, digestion is just as important as learning like training basics. Like you got to get that down early and the earlier you get it down and just stick within that group of foods, like the better off you're going to be. So. Okay. So um, I, I want to touch on the, the green vegetables because that's something, you know, you, you uh, learn anything about health. You're going to, you're going to hear people say, you got to get your greens and you got to get your greens and you got to get your greens in. Um, and, and you just kind of said like, Hey, like watch out for the green vegetables in terms of, of digestion. Now with your, uh, Instagram, uh, saved stories on digestion, you, uh, brought up getting like, a uh, um, powdered greens, uh, to kind of, kind of supplement. Right. Um, so just talk about that. Like, cause you know, I, th I think most of us as bodybuilders, even though we know that 
everything we do might not be the healthiest. We still want to try to make this as healthy as possible and have that longevity. So your suggestion then, Morgan, is to kind of find a, a legit greens uh, like supplement or, or mixture and kind of kind of use that. Is that kind of where you're at with that? Absolutely. I mean, that's what supplements are for, right? Like if you know you can't eat green vegetables in your diet because they give you digestional backup, well, all you need to do is go buy a good green supplement. I use the greens, uh, green surge from Jack Factory. That's a supplement company that sponsors me. I've been using it for a long time. They have, you know, artificially flavored versions. They have uh, uh, naturally flavored versions and they have unflavored versions. So, you know, you can have, you know, if you're trying to stay away from artificial sweeteners, they have options for you and, and you know, everything else. Uh, but that's what I do. Um, I still like, so my, my vegetables and prep, I still did eat vegetables and prep, but strictly mushrooms and peppers. Uh, because you know they were good for some for, for some nutrients for some vitamins and, and things like that but they don't have um, you know they're very um, they don't have like raffinose in it it's a chemical that green vegetables have that, that is plays a big part in the digestion issues um, so it's very low on that so you, you, you know it's just like anyone else in prep like I still like having some vegetables in there for fillers and just added it to the meal and things like that right so I could, I could really eat as much peppers and mushrooms as I wanted. It kind of gave me that extra bit of food in my meal, but it didn't bother my digestional backup. So this is just something I learned through trial and error that these are the ones that work with me. So I'm going to stick with them. By the end of, I haven't touched the veg, uh, pepper or mushroom since, <laughs> right? But, but it got me through, you know? And then I would use a greens powder twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening, make sure I was still getting all those micronutrients from green vegetables. Obviously being in prep, you're, you're, very energy deprived, very nutrient deprived. So you don't want to miss out on your greens, the nutrients you're going to get from greens uh, or your vitamins. So it's definitely something you want to incorporate. So yeah, greens powder, absolutely perfect for that. And you're probably going to get a more potent dose of the nutrients that you're looking for in the greens powder than you are out of the greens, uh, the vegetables you're going to eat anyway, right? So not to mention because it's a powder, you're going to digest it, you're going to absorb it very easily, right? So I mean, I think greens powder is the way to go all day over eating greens, whether you're in prep or if you're in off season. Excellent. Okay. One, one other thing from, from your uh, saved uh, Instagram stories in terms of digestion, because this is something that I found that's really helped me with like acid reflux. And that is limiting the liquids that you're consuming while you're eating your food. So would you touch on that? Why is it important to not maybe guzzle down a bunch of water while you're, you're eating your food? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, number one, I would say, because, you know, if you drink a lot of water, even like before during a meal, you're going to, you're going to water down the enzymes in your stomach, right? Just like anything, like you imagine your gut, like you have all these enzymes sitting in your gut, basically waiting for food to come down. So the enzymes can start doing their thing, break it down, you digest them, absorb nutrients, et cetera, right? Um, if you just dump a bunch of water in there, now this, this potent like layer of enzymes that you have waiting for food now is watered down right so now you have all the food coming down on top of this water and your enzyme so you're still going to digest it it's just going to elongate the process your stomach's going to have more volume in it um and that's the other thing too like especially when it comes to off-season eating like if you're eating like six big meals a day and if you're drinking water while you're eating every meal you got to think about the stomach distension as well right so as physique athletes we're obviously trying to keep our waist as tight as possible um that's you know when people talk about guts and bodybuilding, um, that that really, in my opinion, is the issue is the massive amount of foods that you've had to eat for years and years and years to get to the size that these guys are. I mean, I know myself, you know, when I got to 330 pounds, I was eating eight or 9,000 calories of clean food a day, right? So again, and that's another thing, even with digestion, why you want your digestion to be optimal, like the smaller you can keep your waist at all times, the better, right? The more you're walking around with a blown out gut and a distended stomach, the more that your abdominal wall is going to stretch, your stomach's going to stretch. So even when you shrink down in contest prep and lose the fat, you can still have the appearance of like having like a belly, even though you're shredded, you know? So between the digestion, uh, you know, thing and, and filling yourself up with water and food all the time, uh, it can definitely play an impact. So I would say those are the biggest two things with drinking water and eating food. It's just watering down your, your enzymes to actually digest your food. And then the stomach distension that it can lead to, which can ultimately make you appear less aesthetic right perfect all right uh so touch on uh uh ron partlow um he's the one that kind of brought you through this year and, and helped you uh, kind of get to that point of earning and receiving your ifbb pro card what did he kind of bring to the table um in terms of coaching 
uh, that maybe was a little bit different or something that he just kind of helped you learn to kind of get to where you're at today? Um, yeah, so totally different coaching style than Dorian. Dorian was very like, um, you know, here's everything you got to do, like super detailed, like, you know, I would say, you know, definitely more complicated coaching style uh, as opposed to Ron. But Ron is someone who's been a mentor to me for a couple of years before I even worked with him. Uh, Ron took an interest in me like pretty early when he saw me coming up through just being like a young, taller bodybuilder because he's a taller guy as well. So he always kind of took time to check in with me and message me, just kind of make sure I was staying on track with everything. And um, so, I mean, he was always someone I kind of was in the back of my head that I wanted to work with one day. Um, and then obviously, you know, he started his podcast. So getting to watch his podcast like week after week and learning more about him and like, you know, his his ideology on training and nutrition, like I kind of realized like, okay, me and this guy would, would work really well together. Like we really see eye to eye, not only bodybuilding stuff, but just like life stuff as well, right? So you kind of know when you're gonna click with someone just based off hearing them speak. Um, so yeah, when I decided I was ready to get a coach again and start prepping, uh, I just, I, I hit him up. I mean, there was no one else I was really even thinking about working with, to be honest, he, I, I kind of knew he was the guy. and. I messaged him. I was like, Hey man, like you taking new clients. And, uh, he was like, Nope. He was like, but I'll take you. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, sweet, sweet. So, but, but, you know, he, like Ron actually took time to have like two, like one and a half hour FaceTime calls with me before I even started paying. Him. So, you know, when you get someone that does that, you know, they're invested in you and, and you know, they actually want you as a client, you know, they want to help you. So that just said so much to me. So like, I was sold on it after that, that he was just taking time out of his day to discuss like, you know, what we were going to be doing eight months down the road. Right. So, uh, yeah, I started working with Ron, very, very basic approach. Um, he, he communicated with me very well, but I, but I was also very forward with him that I wasn't looking to just be told what to do. I was very in touch with my body at that point. Like I, I knew that like what types of training was working for me at the time. I, like, again, I had my foods pinpointed from working with Dorian beforehand. So I knew I wanted my diet to look like. So I kind of basically sent him a diet and was like, this is what I'm thinking. Okay. He's like, it looks good to me. And then, yeah, I mean, we talked every day since I started working with him um, and would make adjustments as needed. I would just kind of give him the reins on that, you know, let him make the food adjustments, you know, when and where he thought it was needed. Um and yeah, we, we kind of prepped me together in a sense, because I mean, we did have times where we disagreed. Um, I basically, like even in between shows uh, in July from the Atlantics to the Newfoundland show, when I knew I had to come in a lot leaner for the Newfoundland show, I took over completely um, because he kind of wanted me to keep eating like the same amount of food I was eating and still try to bring that, that bigger look. And I was like, no, nah, man. So I sent him a meal plan back, which had a lot less carbs. And he was like, okay, go for it. Like, see what happens. And it worked out. And then between both of us, we had to talk after. And we were like, okay, like we tried this way, we tried this way, this way worked. So now we kind of know my body better. I gave him back the reins for nationals and, and it worked out absolutely perfect, right? So I just feel so fortunate to have him in my corner and, and for things to go the way it went because now I'm excited to just kind of be a pro under, under his guidance. And not to even mention the fact that um, you know, Ron took the time and effort to fly out to Toronto to be with me. You know, he lives in BC. So I was the only client at Canadian Nationals. And yeah, he took the time to, to fly out and actually be there and, and peak me on Thursday and Friday of the show, which I think Indian Air Person played a huge part in us, like bringing that super crisp dry look to the stage. Uh, so yeah, I can't say enough about that guy, man. Honestly, he's great. Awesome. Um, so you touched on um, kind of like, you know, a professional bodybuilder, kind of all of your guys's, this was earlier in our conversation, uh, goal is ultimately to, to get to the Olympia. Um, but before kind of that goal is, um, you know, accomplished and, and, and comes to fruition, you've got to make your pro debut. I'm sure there's some, uh, you know, a lot of improvements that you're, you're focused on. So between yourself and Ron, what is kind of the competition focus moving forward? So luckily, uh, we were, we were lucky. Yeah, we were lucky enough to get a critique from the head judge uh, at nationals, right? Like, like the day after the show, basically. So, um, and, and I mean, you know, every time you get critiques, like you kind of already know what you got to work on based off pictures, and that's the type of person I am. Like, 
you know, I was happy to win, obviously, but the first thing I want to see is how I looked and, and how I looked next to other guys and where my potential weaknesses could be now that I'll be competing at a different level. Um, so, you know, my lower body is pretty good, but we want to obviously improve that because it definitely has the ability to be like super freaky. So we want to take that as far as we can. Um, I think that my shoulders seem to come up a lot uh, in order to kind of match my quad sweeps just to keep myself in proportion. Uh, Cause right now I would say my shoulders are a little bit behind the rest of my body. So I got it. That's one thing I'm, I really got to work on. I'm, I'm uh, probably going to hire a training coach to help me with that because I, <laughs> what I'm doing with shoulders is not working anymore. Um, I think, I think I need to, I know I need to continue to improve my back thickness, even though I think I had the best back in the show, probably at nationals, it, it def, especially where I'm a taller guy, it definitely needs more like density and thickness to it. Uh, especially on my, my lat spread shot. So you know, continue to do what I'm doing for back is my priority because I've made steady progress with my back and training I've been doing. I think I just need to keep sticking with those movements and just, you know, focus on the progressive overload, like that whole thing, right? But so I think the back's going to come up with time. And then uh, my arms as well, which is kind of funny because my arms, my biceps especially, were kind of out of proportion to my shoulders and, and, and the rest of my body for a while. But... Uh, because of that, I started to train triceps like three times a week throughout prep and only training biceps once a week. And now it appears that my triceps have outgrown my biceps. So I think just trying to, you know, the biggest thing for me is just trying to find that balance of my arms and my shoulders and the rest of my body, you know? So, and, and I think between that, I think I also need a lot of work on my presentation. Um, you know, I would say my posing, as far as like hitting the mandatories, I'm very good because I practice it like religiously. So when it comes to actually like, you know, battling it out with guys and hitting the mandatories, I'm pretty good there. But I think just the way I carry myself on stage and, and, and I think I relax a little bit too much in between poses and, and things like that. I think I just need to really work on my overall stage presence and, and also tweaking some of the poses to make them even better as well. So, yeah, I feel like I have a lot of work to do just between, you know, making those improvements and, um, and the posing. So. As of now, we're aiming to start prep at the beginning of this December for the Vancouver Pro, which will be uh, December in 2022. So that's where I'm kind of looking at making my pro debut. I think uh, I think a full year will give me, you know, a good amount of time to make some improvements for sure. That's my biggest thing. Like, I just want to improve show to show. As long as I'm better, uh, you know, that's pretty satisfying to me. But at the same time, like we want to make a bang at the, at the Vancouver pro as well. Like, you know, I'm competing to win, you know, every time. So, you know, when I'm training and getting ready for that show starting in December, like I will have it in my mind, I'm going to win that show. Right. So, uh, but yeah, that's the plan as of now. Very cool. Um, we're we're going to kind of head towards the finish line here. I do want to touch on a couple more things uh, before we wrap it up, Morgan. Um, you also kind of talked <laughs> about, or, uh, alluded to mention very briefly earlier about kind of like how, you know, on social media specifically, things kind of blew up after you uh, uh, won uh, Mr. Canada. Um, what, what does social media look like for you? And, and, and I know you've got your YouTube channel. I'm assuming that you're gonna really continue to try to uh, produce the content there. Um, but how, how do you manage social media? How do you intertwine that with your day-to-day, -day, with your coaching business, with now being a professional bodybuilder? Because it seems like social media is almost a must for uh, people within the fitness industry, specifically bodybuilders. So how do you deal with social media? How do you handle social media? How do you work that into your day-to-day? -day? It's just a massive part of my life, to be honest. I mean, I, I feel like I'm posting stories or thinking about what posts I'm going to make from the time I wake up to the time I go to bed because it's, it's just so relevant. I feel very lucky that my passion and now like, I guess, career and bodybuilding lines up very well with my online coaching business. Obviously, the more successful I am as a bodybuilder and promote that on Instagram, um, the better my coaching business does. You know, I do have a coaching page, um, like a separate Instagram account where, where I post like client transformations and things like that. Uh, just as advertisement purposes, obviously, but I mean, I haven't even had to do that in like, you know, a couple of months just because I have like, I already have a wait list for, my, for, for new clients and like I'm, I'm full for what I can take right now. So I think, you know, you know, pr like promoting myself as a bodybuilder has helped tremendously on the business side of things and the financial side of things. 
which is great for me because obviously being an online coach, like you couldn't have a better job as far as it comes to being a bodybuilder, right? Like I get to be home all day. I can eat what I want. I can train what I want, all that stuff. So, uh, but then the other part of the things is sponsorships as well. Like I, I do have like several sponsors that, you know, uh, you know, you got to do your job and promote them. So Jack factory, uh, you know, that's his t-shirt here. Um, they were, I was actually their first athlete back in 2017. And now like they've grown into like a massive supplement company. Uh, you know, so I'm, I'm very loyal to them and I try to promote them to the best of my abilities. I have a meal prep company that I have that I promote all the time as well. Uh, that you know, kind of like a local meal prep company, but obviously like all that stuff takes up a lot of time. So yeah, social media, it, it, it's, you know, it's like another job as a bodybuilder, right? Cause I mean, you know, the more help you can get, the better as a bodybuilder, right? You know, it's like like free supplements and you're making some money off commission, off your codes and stuff like that. It all goes a long way um, when you have to afford like just being a person, but also being a bodybuilder, right? It's a, it's a whole nother thing. So yeah, I mean, it's something I try to stay on top of, but I also enjoy, like I love creating content and, and then now the more I'm getting steady with my YouTube and I'm kind of in a good crew with it, it's just like another avenue to put out these like longer videos and stuff. And, and, and just like, you know, just a, just another avenue to kind of promote myself, but also put out good information and everything just comes full circle, I find. And, and that's the way I've been growing the last two years. It's just, you know, the more effort I put in the body, the more my business grows and, and vice versa. Right. So for me, social media has been an absolute blessing. And, uh, you know, I think it was used correctly and you just kind of, use them in a positive manner and, and only, you know, have a positive intention with it, whether you're putting like personal stuff out there or business stuff or promoting yourself as a physique athlete, uh, good things will just come back to you. Right. So, you know, that's kind of my take on it. Well put. Um, you mentioned earlier anxiety. Is that something that you uh, struggle with uh, pretty, pretty uh, heavily or severely, or is that just kind of a word that you kind of threw out there just, um, you know, in, in conversation? Uh, no, I, I would say it's pretty severe. I'm, I've been prescribed medication, uh, you know, for it that I just won't take because the way I look at it with bodybuilding is that we take other, you know, supplements and things like that, that can, can make your anxiety worse. Uh, and I think that's definitely impacted me. You know, if I've had any, if I've had any negative side effects from a bodybuilding lifestyle, they've been mental ones and that comes with the territory. Um, but I also refuse to take something that's going to counteract something that I'm doing willingly. So I just choose to deal with my anxiety in my own way and cope with it my own way. And like I said before, like I do a lot of visualization and things like that, that, that really helps. Um, but at the same time, I feel like these days, a lot of people use anxiety as a cop out as well. I mean, uh, just because it's, it's something that has so much awareness around it now. It's something that like if someone drops the anxiety word, it's like, it's like, uh, oh, okay, you get off scot-free. Like, you know what I mean? And personally, I think that's bullshit because I, I just know how much of it I deal with myself and I just deal with it. Now, again, like I realize not everyone's like me, not everyone's as strong-minded as me and, and, and not everybody can do that. And that's fine. Like, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be medicated for anxiety because there's different levels of it. I, I totally understand that, right? But I just know for myself, I've been able to take my anxiety and almost use it as a tool to kind of be a more productive person and a better person because my anxiety doesn't want me to be productive. My anxiety wants me to be in a dark room all day watching Netflix eating potato chips, right? But I know that's not what I want. So my anxiety is always there chirping in my head and I'm just always overcoming it and overcoming it and overcoming it. And the more you overcome it, the, the easier it gets to do so. So now when I have these thoughts that come in my head, like, oh, I don't want to do that or I don't want to do this, it's almost like instantaneous. No, like you have to go do that, right? Because that's what's going to, you know, yield the result you want and get you where you want to be, right? So, so yeah, but I mean, it's something that I've just learned to deal with and, and even use in like a positive manner, you know, to a certain extent. Well, what is, uh, if you don't mind me asking, because it's something that I personally struggle with too, um, what, what, what is... Like for you, because anxiety, I think uh, for different people takes on different forms, but what is it, uh, what is it for you? Do you have like triggers or do you have, you know, something or situations or uh, people that kind of like cause that anxiety to be heightened? What, what does it look like when you open your eyes and, and, and wake up in the morning? What, what does that anxiety look like? How, what form does it take on for you specifically, Morgan, if you don't mind touching on that? It's, yeah, it's generally like early morning anxiety of just like, like of all the tasks that build up that I have to take care of. Like 
I'll have myself, like I'll wake up at 7.30 and have myself convince my eight that there is no possible way I'm going to be able to do everything I have to do in that day. And the world is going to end because of it. Because I'm going to then, because I have myself convinced that I'm going to fail before I even get started. Right? That's why that hour cardio is so key for me in the morning and why it's non-negotiable. Right? It doesn't matter what my goals are physically. I'm going to go get on the treadmill or I'm going to go outside and walk because I need to just move forward and I need that time to clear my thoughts, convince myself that everything's going to be okay. I'm going to organize my tasks. This is how I'm going to do them, right? This is the order they're going to happen. This is the time they're going to happen. And then most days I get everything done by like four or five o'clock <laughs> and, and everything's okay. But I know the anxiety I deal with is real because this is every single day. It doesn't matter. It, it, it was the same thing the day after I won my pro card. I should have been on top of the world, didn't care about anything but I had all these things I had to do and they had to get done. Right. And it's, it's just the way I am. So like, you know, you, you can call it OCD, I guess, anxiety, whatever. I'm sure it's a combination of a few things. Right. But like I said, even though I have to deal with that every morning, I can, I can uh, compartmentalize it. I can, I learn to cope with it and it ends up leading to me just having a very productive day every day. And I know by the time five, six, seven o'clock hits, whenever I'm done everything I had to do, all my online clients are taken care of. I got my meals in. I have a good training session that day. All the responsibilities are taken care of. Like then I'm at peace. And then I can take the two or three hours by myself in the evening to kind of decompress, go to bed, get a good sleep and get up and start over. Like that's, that's the goal every day, right? It's just to win every single day and uh, go to bed knowing that you did everything that day you were supposed to do and tomorrow you're going to be better because of it or you're going to be in a better financial situation because of it or like whatever, right? Very cool, man. I appreciate you touch on that. Um, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up here. Uh, are there any kind of final words? Or we had a very thorough conversation, touched on a lot of different things, uh, and I greatly appreciate that, Morgan. Do you have any final words or anything that you would like to kind of um, share with the listeners, maybe that we didn't touch on already? No, not really, man. I would just say that uh, you know, if you have a big goal that you're chasing after uh, that might seem out of reach just know that it's not and that if you keep working towards it every day you can have it and it, you know who knows how long it might take but I swear to god <laughs> if you just keep working and don't give up you can have anything you want because if I can be a pro bodybuilder pretty much anybody can do anything <laughs> so that's that's what I truly believe so yeah that's that's the last message I, I'd like to leave for sure powerful man um, you already brought up uh, Jack Factory. Um, why don't you, if you want to share a little bit more about them, um, talk about where people can follow along, YouTube, kind of all the things that you kind of want to share in terms of yeah. people connecting with you. Go, go for it. For sure. Yeah. So actually for Jack Factory, this we use Jack Week. So we have a ton of sales on the go, tons of good promotion. So if you ever wanted to try any Jack Factory products, now would be a good time to do it. Uh, you can also use my code Big Mo, so just B-I-G-M-O-E, all one word. You can get 20% off all Jack Factory stuff. So again, if you want to try anything out, uh, you know, go ahead. Uh, great company, great quality products, you know, highly recommend everything. What, no matter what you're looking for, good pre-workouts, really good protein powder, good EAAs, all the basics, right? Um, yeah, that and, oh yeah, so my Instagram, uh, just MorganMac.Bodybuilding. Uh, if you're interested in coaching, even though I'm not taking the clients right now, it's morganmac.nutrition and, um, check that out in my YouTube. I've been pretty steady with that since the beginning of my prep. Uh, so that's just Morgan Mac bodybuilding, uh, type that into YouTube and you'll find me. And yeah, I'm rolling out like three or four videos a day, you know, training videos of me talking about different topics, you know, day of life stuff, day of eating stuff. So if you want a little insight on what my life looks like, uh, you'll find it there. So yeah. yeah, yeah, I think that's it, man. Cool. Morgan, thank you so much for uh, chopping up with me. It's greatly appreciated. Oh man, I had a great time, man. If you ever want to do it again, let me know. For sure. Dude, I'll, I'll take you up on that offer. We can do a round two, kind of maybe get into more of, uh, you know, in depths of uh, some of some of the coaching and things like that for you specifically. So um, definitely sure. I'll take you up on that offer, my man. Um, and for the listeners, uh, go ahead, go to um, Instagram, uh, follow Morgan. Like he said, he puts out a lot of uh, valuable information. He kind of keeps everything um, up front and straight with you. I, I found uh, the digestion part of his save stories very, very valuable. Um, so he is very forthcoming on his Instagram. 
a lot of great content. So make sure you go follow him. Um, make sure you go subscribe to his YouTube channel. Like he said, he's been putting out uh, content very steadily. Um, again, keeping it, keeping it real, keeping it raw. Get to see uh, behind the scenes of an IFBB pro, Mr. Canada body, Mr. Canada bodybuilder. So make sure you go uh, go follow Morgan on all the platforms. Um, listeners, thank you so much again for tuning in, watching another episode of Behind the Muscle podcast. Um, two huge favors I would ask of you. First of all, if you haven't done so already, hit the subs- subscribe button on YouTube. That's where I release all of these episodes first. So if you want to kind of stay on top and ahead of the curve in terms of Behind the Muscle podcast being released, subscribe to the YouTube channel. The second favor, as you guys found a lot of great value in Morgan's uh, episode today, he dropped a a, a lot of great wisdom, a lot of great insight in terms of bodybuilding um, and kind of all the things, the finer details. Make sure you take this episode and share it on all of your social media platforms and then make sure you tag Morgan and tag behind the muscle. That way we know people are listening, people are gaining, um, you know, just valuable uh, information insights from this episode specifically. And finally, I will leave you all with this. Remember behind the muscle, there's always a story. We'll catch you guys later.